Thank you, Beth. That was uh, that was awesome and very brave of you to uh, <laughs> to do that demo. Uh, the we had not actually gotten that working before we started, and uh, and Lauren said that she heard some of the uh, the crew going that this is going really well for a rehearsal. So. <laughs> All right, so uh, we, have, we have one more uh, speaker now, and, um, and as I've mentioned a couple of times, you know, he's really the thought leader around, uh, around the whole concept of edge computing, from Carnegie Mellon University, so it's awesome to, to have him here today um, speaking to us. So help me welcome up Satya from Carnegie Mellon. All right, can you hear me loud enough? Good. Um, so thank you very much, Jonathan and Mark uh, and the rest of the team for uh, welcoming me and inviting me to present. I wanted to share with you uh, the lessons that we have learned over about a decade on why edge computing is not just an incremental technology, it is truly disruptive. Okay? So, um, Hopefully, what I have to share with you will stretch your minds, help you see the potential far beyond just next year or the year after, but in terms of truly strategic thinking. So, there are really four fundamental reasons why edge computing is a disruptive technology. First and foremost, it is the only way to cope with physics, as Beth was mentioning, if you want to offer highly responsive cloud services where latency can be controlled and kept low, there is really no other alternative. And let me put it this way. Deploying 5G without edge computing is a waste of time and money that the low latency offered by 5G is going to be completely swamped by the tail of the backhaul if you do not have the processing happening close to the edge. A second, independent of latency considerations, the cumulative bandwidth from a large number of sensors, especially think of video sensors, video cameras are cheap, they're on cars, they're on drones, they're on people. You can put them on pets, right? Imagine what the total ingress bandwidth of a city like San Francisco would be into the cloud if all that video had to be streamed live. So if you're ever going to be able to use video in real time with processing, then you're going to have to move the compute much, much closer to where the capture of the data is happening. And everything I say about video is also true about other kinds of sensors. It's just easiest for us to think about video simply because it is such an easy example to relate to. The Internet of Things is big, and there are companies like Nest, now part of Google, and many others. Um, Intel has an entire uh, IoT division. So the belief is that every home is going to become a highly sensed and automated environment. However, there is pushback because there's considerable concern that releasing all that data to the cloud is losing control of privacy. And so it turns out that the ability to have a privacy firewall under your control, which runs software in real time, examining the data that is being released, and possibly alerting you, possibly redacting the data, etc., based on your policies, is an extraordinarily valuable thing to have. So just as a network firewall keeps bad things out, a privacy firewall keeps sensitive things in. And so that role is something uniquely uh, a, a capability of edge computing. And last but not least, the more dependent we become on the cloud, and cloud computing, by the way, is not going to go away. 
It's going to get bigger and better, and hopefully edge computing can make it even better. And here's how. The more dependent you become on the cloud, the more pain you're going to feel when you cannot get to the cloud. The ability to have fallback so that if there's a transient network failure, a denial of service attack, or some other similar situation is extraordinarily powerful. So the ability of an edge node close to you to temporarily offer you fallback cloud services, just like a uninterruptible power supply gives you backup power for a few minutes if the power is transiently down, that kind of use is an extraordinarily valuable use of edge computing. So we have been exploring all of these, but I, you know, Jonathan only gave me 25 minutes, so there's no way I'm ever going to tell you about all this exciting stuff. I'm going to focus on just one, okay? What is it that you can do with a lot of compute accessible at very low latency? Okay, I'm going to have to use a word to describe these edge nodes, and I'm going to use the word cloudlet. It's a nice name, it's reminiscent of cloud computing, fits OpenStack perfectly. So my vision of, open, of, of a cloudlet is a small data center. I love the term cloud in a box that I think Beth mentioned. It's exactly right. That's what we call a cloudlet. It could be one wireless hop or a 4G LTE hop or a 5G someday, maybe an additional LAN or fiber hop, so that it doesn't really have to be in the access point or the cell tower. It could be a little deeper. But the important point is you have one hop followed by almost no further delay. It's multi-tenant. I think at the end of the day, for the widest possible use, you have to have the same kind of usability of those edge resources that you have off the cloud. Once you have multi-tenancy and multiple users, like all of you in this room should be able to use a nearby cloudlet while you're here. That requires safety and isolation, and typically virtual machines are the best way to provide that. Now, you may on top of this for scalability have dockers within VMs, but our vision is the lowest layer is virtual machines with Docker as a layer above. Now, there are two things you do not have to worry about in cloudlets, and this is important. We assume that the cloudlet has a sufficiently large source of energy, either it's plugged into the wall, or for example, it's in an automobile. So if you have enough energy to move multiple occupants at highway speeds, you don't worry too much about how much energy your edge node is going to consume, okay? On the other hand, if you're a wearable device, you don't want to carry a lot of compute with you, you offload to the cloudlet, which is doing the compute. Similarly, if you're a drone, it's easy to put a video camera on the drone. But to carry along and compute that is powerful enough to do real-time video processing of that captured data, your drone would have to be really powerful and large to do that. Much simpler to use a small drone, transmit the video to a cloudlet, which doesn't have those constraints. And of course, things like weight, size, heat dissipation, all of these things matter once you start talking about wearable devices, handheld devices, drones, etc. So these are the constraints that you're freed from by using a cloudlet. And I will show you in the next few minutes how this combination can be truly disruptive. So we assume a deployment picture that looks roughly as in this graph. You have the cloud world today, OpenStack prominently uh, shown here. And I would love to see the cloudlets at the edge all running slightly extended versions of OpenStack. And in this afternoon's seminar on infrastructure at the edge, I will share my thoughts on what that could potentially be. Um, as a number of previous speakers have said, 
it may also be necessary to strip down OpenStack in order to suit the edge. So I think of it as OpenStack minus minus followed by plus plus. Okay? You have to strip it down a bit, but you also need some new functionality that is specific to edge computing. So the way forward, I believe, is a very huge opportunity for OpenStack as an open source project, and people are familiar with it. It's already used in data centers. There's an enormous amount of cultural knowledge about OpenStack that can be leveraged to make edge computing um, accelerated and successful. So quick question. People often ask me, you know, today's internet works. Does latency really matter? The answer is yes. It's documented in a number of measurement papers that we have published. Let me just show you one example. This is an augmented reality example not written by us. It's actually written by a team at Intel. It runs on um, a front end that's a smartphone. You capture a image, for example, a photograph of San Francisco. Ship the JPEG image to a back end that's running in the cloud or a cloudlet. It does computer vision, recognizes the buildings, annotates this is the Transamerica building, this is Coit Tower, etc., and sends you back the labels and the coordinates which you then display to the user. So the user experience is you just hold it up and the annotations appear for you. So imagine you do this completely on board the smartphone. What I'm showing here on the x-axis is the number of milliseconds it takes before the user sees the annotations. And the vertical axis is what fraction of the responses come back. The perfect curve would be a step function at zero. That means it's instantaneous. As soon as you hold up your camera, it appears. This is really sluggish because you're doing the computer vision on board the smartphone. Now what happens if you offload to Amazon East, which amazingly, from Pittsburgh, is only six milliseconds away in Virginia? Okay, that's the picture that you get. If you offload to Amazon West, which is out here, you can see that the cross-country internet latency kicks in. Going to Dublin from Pittsburgh is almost as good as coming to the West Coast. It's only a little further. Going to Asia, Amazon Asia, it's a lot further. What can a Wi-Fi cloud, cloudlet do for you? That's what it can do for you. It is much, much closer than even Amazon East in terms of the user responsiveness. What happens if the first hop is 4G LTE rather than Wi-Fi? 4G LTE has a longer end-to-end -end latency, and so you see all the curves shifted, but the relative picture remains the same. Now, this is just one example, but those papers that I have listed have plenty of other uh, data for many other applications that show without any question for interactive applications, this is big. So that's user experience. But there's another aspect of mobile computing that every user cares about, which is battery life. For that application that I just showed you, this is how many joules of energy are burned on the mobile device while the operation is performed. So if you do it all on the mobile device, that's the complete computer vision compute. So it takes 5.4 joules. If you send the image to the cloudlet, you are burning Wi-Fi energy in transmission, first hop. Of course, any additional hops are free of, in terms of energy, but your mobile device is still on, waiting for a reply. So as you notice, as you go further and wait longer for the result, the amount of energy consumed increases significantly. Now, hardware designers work very aggressively to try and optimize this, but they also have to trade off responsiveness because when the reply packet arrives, you have to wake up 
your receiver from a deep sleep state, and essentially that adds to latency. So there's a fundamental trade-off between the aggressiveness of power savings and the crispness of user experience. And so consistently, not just for augmented reality, but for face recognition and all the other applications that we have explored, there is a very clear correlation between battery life extension and edge computing. Computing close by, offloading close by, can give you big wins in terms of savings. So I now want to move really far into the future. Someday, we hope there'll be lots of cloudlets around. How will this transform people's lives? Not in incremental ways, but in fundamental ways. I believe the opportunity lies in the following way. We happen to be living, by coincidence, at a time when three completely separate innovations, unrelated to each other, are all converging. So one of them is, of course, edge computing, which is why we're here. Completely independent of us, artificial intelligence in its numerous forms, computer vision, natural language processing, you know, Skype now does language translation, okay, in real time. Um, Google Goggles does translation for you. IBM's Watson in 2011 defeated the Jeopardy champion. So it's very clear. Things that were not conceivable a decade ago are, are really very good, highly accurate, but they're enormously resource intensive. You cannot do them on your smartphone, on your Google Glass, on your HoloLens, anything you would want to carry with you or wear, you're not going to be able to do it. But the third innovation is the growth of wearable hardware of the kinds that I've mentioned. And I've just listed a few examples here. The number of companies is large. So the application that I see as a killer application lies at the intersection of all three, okay? So imagine this person wearing, in this case, Google Glass, but could be any of the other devices. It has a lot of sensors. It has a video camera, it's got a microphone, gyroscope, accelerometer. All of those are streamed over the wireless network to a cloudlet that is close by. And that cloudlet is powerful enough to do computer vision in real time, natural language processing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what you have is a situation in which the algorithms on the cloudlet see what the user sees, hear what the user hears, sense what the user senses. If they can compute faster than the user can think, and perhaps whisper helpful guidance, that would transform human life. Imagine a person on the verge of being admitted to a nursing home because of Alzheimer's disease. Now, with the assistance of a device like this, you're able to recognize people better. You have helpful hints whispered in your ear to go through your daily life. There is evidence that even a one-month delay in admitting people to a nursing home could save the United States $1 billion a year. That's a stunning figure. And of course, the quality of lives of those people and their caregivers is also better. So that's an assistive example. Let me show you some more practical things. You don't have to wait to grow old before edge computing can be valuable. It can help you even when you're very young. So here's a guy trying to cook. One of the earliest apps for Google Glass was being able to see recipes in your head-up display. So your hands were free, and this thing says the next step is heat one tablespoon of oil until, the, until it sizzles. Now, if you had a good friend standing next to this person, he or she might say, wait, wait, don't, don't put the stuff in yet. The oil is not sizzling. That is active guidance. Okay? Every one of you in this room has used a system like this, except you've never thought of it this way. Okay? 
Think of how a GPS navigation system works. Once upon a time, people who are old enough, like me, with gray hair, had to deal with paper maps. First question was, where am I on this map? And then, how do I get to where I want to go? It's a true test of your marriage. If you can survive many trips, OK? And, and not break up because of map interpretation. So GPS navigation has transformed that problem. It uses one sensor. It has deep knowledge of the task. And it gives you step-by-step -step guidance. If you make a mistake or ignore it, like you don't take the exit, it catches it right away and tells you what to do. At the next opportunity, make a legal U-turn. Could we generalize this metaphor? So I don't have time to go into the details of this over the last number of years. We've been working on a system called Gabriel, which you can think of as a platform, as a service, layered above the edge computing layer. So this would run on top of your cloudlet, effectively enabling you to use microservices on the cloudlet on behalf of your mobile device. OK? So um, I, I will skip the details in the interest of getting through the rest of it. I want to show you a video, and I will let Jonathan here do the honors, because we had to move this to a new laptop. OK? So this is the world's first wearable cognitive assistant. We had to try something very simple. This is 2D Lego. Once the task is loaded, you're seeing the camera feed from Google Glass, what the user sees. And the little display on the top right is what is shown to him, and the voice is what he hears. Welcome to the Lego task. As a first step, please find a piece of one by four green brick and put it on the board. Excellent. Now find a one by one white piece and add it to the top of the current model. Good job. Now find a one by one black piece and add it to the top right of the current model. The really interesting question is, if he makes a mistake, will it find it? Great. Now find a one by two white piece and add it to the top of the current model. Now find a one by one green piece and add it to the top left of the current model. Once you did something wrong, our system will tell you how to fix it. You are quite close. Now slightly move the one by one green piece to the right by one brick size. Great. Now find you a one by it. one green piece and add it to the top left left of the current model. Okay. So what is going on is on each video frame, you are correcting for vision, lighting, angle of the user, et cetera, et cetera, and extracting that matrix at the bottom right, which is like an analog to digital conversion in a very task-specific way. And you have to do this in real time. Now, that Lego did not seem so latency sensitive. So what? The guy might get bored a bit. But suppose you're trying to make a ping pong assistant. Our Google Glass-based ping pong assistant helps the user to play better ping pong by whispering whether the user should hit to the left or to the right. The hint is based on the observed ball position and opponent position. So the user who's playing from whom, from whom you get this view is wearing yeah. Google Glass and using a cloudlet over Wi-Fi. OK, so it is basically in real time right. judging the direction of the ball, the direction of the opponent, and tells him where see, to hit. We always guide a user to hit the ball to the, to the side, which is harder 
to catch. Now, you know, you might say playing ping pong is fine, but something that all of us have experienced is going to IKEA, buying one of those miserable kits, reading their printer directions, and making a mess. This is a real IKEA kit. Observe that when he takes that kit, the seal is unbroken. In this application, our wearable system helps the user to assemble a piece of furniture. We are demonstrating using a real IKEA lab. But instead of reading the instruction sheet, the user gets instructions from short video clips displayed on a smart glass. And our system provides appropriate feedback based on real-time analysis of user action. Put the base on the table. So now we have added video, which the user can see, tells him what to do, and then notes when he's done with this step. Screw the pipe on top of the base. Good job. Now find the shade cover and expand it. So can we have another minute or so? OK. This won't take very long, but I'd like to get to the point where it actually tells him that he has made a mistake. So this is computer vision in real time. OK. Put the iron wires to support the shade and show the top view of the shade. As we can see, the system is able to accurately and quickly recognize a user's progress and provide appropriate video tutorial. The video tutorial will play repeatedly until the user finishes a step. So guys made a mistake. When the user makes a mistake, the system will quickly catch it and offer instructions to fix it. You have attached one wire. Now find another one to support the shade. So he had forgotten to put the other wire, and it told him that he didn't, and you can kill it. OK, so the rest of it goes on, and he completes the whole thing, and uh, there are no tears shed in the process. So think about this. Assembly, think of a Weber, which makes uh, uh, you know, grills, any, any IKEA, many other companies. If you can reduce user error, returns, et cetera, frustration, you've dramatically simplified and improved your bottom line. A big part of industrial troubleshooting is expertise on the specifics of the machinery you're trying to repair. Siemens, GE, any of these companies that do industrial troubleshooting will find this enormously valuable. Medical training, look at that picture. That is a mannequin. Okay, it's not a human patient. Yet, that medical student needs a full-fledged, expensive doctor next to him to teach him how to examine the patient. Elder care where, for example, you are taking your own blood pressure, et cetera, a big source of problems is people don't do it right. And as a result, the measurements are not useful. To the extent you can have a aid that guides you to do it right each time, especially if you're on the verge of senility, is very huge. And last but not least, imagine just as about you, you're about to commit some unhealthy act you have a cognitive assistant that tells you, no, don't do that. <laughs> so the way, <laughs> the way to think about all of this is it, it has the look and feel and the latency intolerance of augmented reality, which people have thought of up to now as an entertainment, but it's combining in real time in the inner loop of human cognition faster than humans can think the tools of AI. So it is the intersection of augmented reality and artificial intelligence with the human experience at the center of it. So I hope I've convinced you that while we have some distance to go before these kinds of applications are things we can count on every day and use every day, edge computing is indispensable. There's no way to do any of what I've showed you without edge computing, okay? And so in that sense, it's a truly disruptive technology. Thank you.